Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Saturday edition of Let's Talk with me, Julie Ali. To hope you're going to stay with us throughout the show. We have two interviews lined up for you and the first one being uh, medically related. We're going to be talking pelvic floor damage with a urologist and later on in the show we're going to talk about the Utba Wellness Center based in Indonesia and it's a center for females only. But right now, urology and uh, I guess when we're talking pelvic floor damage, it is really an issue around women and women's health. In studio, we have a Dr. Mamitele, Dr. Craig Mamitele. He is a urologist based at the Urology Hospital in Pretoria. Good morning, welcome to the program. Morning and thank you for the invite. Well, I'm really excited to have you here because what you've just told me off air mm -hmm. um, says a lot about your hospital and the medical professionals working there. Um, I was quite blown away when you said that the urology hospital in Pretoria, where you practice from, is the only one, in, one of its kind in Africa, the entire Africa. Yes, it is. It is um, actually... Um, yeah, we, we're the only one. We boast with, I think, we're about 24 urologists and other supporting uh, disciplines as well. We have surgeon, um, the intensivist, even a gynae as well. We have physiotherapist as well who are working there and obviously the nursing staff as well, the specialized nursing staff. So how long have you guys been operating from Pretoria? I think last week or Last week or this week, the hospital turned 22 years um, of existence. And um, another thing that we pride ourselves, we the first one to bring a robot in Africa to operate with a robot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, that's, that's just an amazing achievement and really good to know that we here in South Africa can boast a first like this. And of course, um, we in our part of the global village, I should imagine that we are on par with any other hospital anywhere in the world as far as the discipline that you offer. Yes, yes, yes. Um, if you look at what we do, it's exactly on par. Even the international specialists, they come and, um, and present on, with, with us or they invite some of our surgeons to go uh, present uh, overseas so I will share knowledge and experiences on what we do as well. Okay, for the purposes of today's program we're going to be talking pelvic floor damage mm. and immediately it suggests to me it's a female problem. Yes. Would I be correct in thinking that? It is. Uh, most of the time, uh, probably it's very rare. Personally, I've never seen a male with a pelvic organ prolapse. So the pelvic floor damage, we, the medical term that we use is pelvic, pelvic floor prolapse. So what basically it means is that the organs which are in the pelvis, they protrude through the vagina. So in a maid, if you look at what we have in a maid, there's only one orifice. Uh, it's actually two. The other one is through the penis. The other one is through the rectum. In a female, there's the urethra, which is very short, and the vagina and the rectum. So the vagina, that's where most of the prolapse happens. So the condition affects mostly women and it's very rare in males. Is it because women bear children and would that be one of possibly the side effects to giving birth and that perhaps at some stage in your life you'll be presenting with a pelvic floor damage or are there other issues at play here? Right. Um, pregnancy is the most the risk factor that we see, which is mostly common in women, especially with vaginal delivery. So if you were to compare the vaginal delivery and caesarean section, uh, the risk increases more with the vaginal delivery, especially if you're going to have more than one kid. We call it multiparous women as well. So, But there are other things which, which are at play as well. 
So women, as we know, that they go through menopause. When they go through menopause, you get your ovaries not working, and then you don't produce enough estrogen. So what estrogen normally does, it keeps your, your tissues very healthy and very strong. So the minute you go through menopause, they become a bit lax and then lose a bit. So it's all women, sadly women, that are plagued with all of these issues. Yeah, most of the time it is. Um, as I explained, the anatomy, um, so they have areas which can herniate, the pelvic organs, they can herniate. Um, if you look at the human being, so the pelvic floor, that's what holds everything uh, when you're standing in terms of gravity. So if there's a bit of a hole there, a weakness, so things will start coming out. So um, other risk factors besides pregnancy itself, it will be anything which can increase intra-abdominal pressure. For example, if you suffer from constipation, oh. and then if you have what we call chronic uh, pulmonary airway disease, uh, asthma or COPD, the chronic smokers, they get that. And then in rare cases, we have patients with uh, uh, connective tissue diseases like Marfan's disease, where their, their, their connective tissues are very lax, their ligaments are very lax. Those would be those people who do funny things and bend their arms the other way around. So if you're a woman and you're, you're capable of that with Marfan's disease, you're more likely your, 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 your ligaments, which are supposed to hold your pelvic organs, they can lapse as well. So it's pregnancy, menopause, anything which can increase intra-abdominal pressure and connective tissue diseases which are congenital. And does pregnant women ever present with problems? I'm assuming a woman has had one or a couple of babies naturally. Mm. Um, should she be taking extra precautions with her future pregnancies in terms of pelvic floor damage? All right, so if you look at what was happening before and now, um, there are certain conditions when, when you are pregnant and you go to a gynae, they would assess and measure the size of your child, how big your child is, to mitigate the problems of being, having what we call uh, CPD, cephalo pelvic disproportion. That means uh, the head of a child is too big or the child is too big to pass through the birth canal normally. So if you force and you, don't, you are not prepared accordingly, these are some of the risks which are going to happen later in life. So if your gynae or your obstetrician says that, they would advise you it's better we do a caesarean section because if you want to do a normal delivery, it may, you may have problems and then later. They may not come now, but the risk increases in the next five to 10 years. And it gets worse when you get to menopause because now with the low estrogen and your tissues starting to get lax, your things get worse as well. Then you may have prolapse. Okay, and I suppose that's one of the reasons why we're seeing more and more seizures being performed these days, but we'll mm -hmm. address that after the ad break. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Mami Tele is in studio with me. He is talking about urological issues. He's from the urology hospital based in Pretoria, one of its kind, the only one in the whole of Africa, and they obviously specialize in urological issues. Don't go away, we'll be back talking more about urology and other related matters. We have Dr. Mamitele from the Urology Hospital in Pretoria talking to us about urological issues. We are going to focus in this part of the interview on pelvic floor damage, but other issues will be touched on as well. I'm wondering why am I talking to you about childbirth, pelvic floor damage, caesareans, natural births, etc., as opposed to a gynecologist? Okay. So in our specialty with the blood, with, with the gynes, we share a certain area which is almost like a gray zone. Um, but during our training, we have uh, meetings where we meet and then we discuss the same thing. Um, what we always, when we joke about, we say the bladder belongs to us. So even if it protrudes through the genitals of a female, it's still ours. 
and then anything which is belongs to the genital females it's a, the kindness they want to own it as well but it's a gray zone we both trained in it and it also depends on a surgical surgeon how comfortable they they are in in treating those conditions because at some point you choose whether you enjoy doing that part or you focus focus on other conditions as well before the ad break, I asked you about, you suggested that women who have multiple babies, mm -hmm. perhaps um, they need to assess whether they're going to have natural birth or go for the Caesar route. Mm -hmm. Would you comfortably say that perhaps Caesars are better options because of all of these side effects that we're seeing? All right. So it, it's not to suggest that everyone needs to go for a Caesarean section. What, it, what needs to happen, you need to have an obstetrician who's going to take you through the journey and advise you. And even after, if, let's say you've had multiple pregnancies, as you get older and older and you go through menopause, there's what we call, because of the low estrogen that you get, there's what we call hormone replacement therapy. Of course. So we can replace that estrogen so that we keep your, uh, your pelvic floor uh, um, uh, healthy. And, and, and matured. Another thing that we do, um, we use the physiotherapist. Um, they can teach you how to strengthen the pelvic floor. So basically the pelvic floor, it, uh, the supporting structures, it's mainly the muscles and the fascias. The fascias are the ligaments that are there. So with the muscles, they are the integral part. So a physio can help with pelvic, pelvic floor exercises, keep them healthy, and stronger and then you may avoid having all these problems later in life. As a matter of cause and common sense, would you mm. advise women uh, even pre and post having their babies to perhaps do those exercises to ensure good health going forward? Yes, yes, yes. That, 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 that is spot on because uh, prevention is better than cure. Mm -hmm. When we start operating, remember now, we're trying to reconstruct. And if things are done properly and you strengthen your pelvic floor, you won't have much of a problems later in life. I think you're quite well aware that uh, cancers in children seems to be on the rise and in general right across the board. Yes. Uh, people, it's, it's, it's almost as if it's, you know, the disease of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing more and more cancers as far as urology is concerned and how would they present? Right. We are seeing a lot of cancers um, in our specialty, um, in South African statistics, breast cancer and cervical cancer in terms of females is the leading one. With us, it's prostate cancer in males. So one of the things, it's still debatable on why we're seeing the increases, whether it's because um, our health system now is starting to improve, we're screening more patients, and there's better access to everyone, even those who are disadvantaged. It could be that as well. Um, but in any case, globally, there is an increase. Whether it's all the radiation that we are getting exposed to, the increase in the Western life of living, increasing uh, the diet that we take, and, and the lack of exercising as well, all those things, they contribute. Even the other things which um, they're also investigating is the pesticides, how our fruits are prepared and things like that. All these things, when they accumulate, they can cause what we call carcinogens, and then they can increase the chances of cancer. So that can happen in almost all the departments in, in the body. Um, they, we, we're certainly seeing all the increases. And smoking as well. Uh, more people are, more, are smoking. Um, younger kids as well, women also are smoking, so it also increases the carcinogens in your body, so we are more likely to see more cancers. When we talk about the pelvic floor and the health of the pelvic floor, mm. um, are you seeing cancers in that area as well? Or are there other symptoms and signs that um, people, women especially, should be looking out for. You've indicated how it presents, and mm. I'm wondering about the discomfort and pain, perhaps, that's associated with it. All right. So with pelvic floor prolapse, there's two ways of presenting. Most of the patients, depending on the degree of the prolapse, if it's minor prolapse like grade 1 and grade 2, usually it's still almost on the internal part of it. 
So that means the organs they've just prolapsed a bit. They're not going outside the introitus or the um, the vagina. It's not going outside. Excuse the language, but it's not going outside the external uh, genitalia. So those patients they won't feel anything. They won't see anything. They may have a feeling, a heavy feeling down there, but they would they would ignore it most of the time. So those who pre the ones who present are those when things are getting worse. So what it means um, <clears throat> is that when the bladder prolapses in front and then it starts also pulling the urethra, the outlet, it starts causing obstructive symptoms in when you urinate. And then the more you keep urine in your bladder and you can urinate fully, you get recurrent infections. When the vagina prolapses, the inside of it or the uterus itself coming out, um, it starts getting dry, it becomes painful. Even when you want to engage um, with intercourse, it gets painful. And then on the back side of the vagina is the rectum. If that part of the rectum also prolapses into oh. the vagina, you have problems with uh, defecation as well. So you also have that feeling that you need to go and because you're not emptying fully as well. And then you get more of your stools getting impacted and then getting more um, constipation as well. And lots of discomfort and possibly pain as well. Yes. Now you spoke about, we talking obviously pelvic f uh, floor uh, prolapse. Mm -hmm. How is that different to a bladder prolapse? Because I know a lot of women probably go to have it lifted yes. because they're very uncomfortable and uh, you know experience everything that you've just outlined now mm. is it similar is it different and when you're having um, you know when you're having the operation to correct it no. um, could you kind of do the two together yes. the pelvic floor and the bladder yes so what what normally happens just to um, there are pictures that will show um, on the anterior part, that will be anterior part, it's, it's the bladder in a female. So the central part that we're talking about will be the vagina. On the anterior part is the bladder. So if most of the prolapse is from the anterior, it will be the bladder prolapsing. If it's more at the apical at the top, it will be the uterus. If you don't have the uterus, we'll, we'll call it the enterocell. From the back, it will be the rectocell. It's the rectum prolapsing. So depending. If the whole pelvic floor is loose, everything can come down. The bladder, the, the, the apical, the uterus, even the rectum. So whenever we, 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 we evaluate, before we operate, we want to check all those things. And another thing, um, it's, it's to help you and, and let you know that this is what we're going to do. We're going to re repair the anterior part, the posterior part, Sometimes if we think everything is too much, it's better to even open from the abdominal side and pull everything and anchor it through the abdomen. But nowadays it's even much easier. We can do laparoscopy or robotic assisted where we don't need to make a big scar to open you up. With few incisions, we put in instruments and put in a mesh. We can lift the everything and then put it back into position as well. And recovery time for a procedure like this, because it does sound like a big procedure. Yes. So op, um, when we talk laparoscopy, that means um, it's less minimal in, invasion. It's minimally inv invasive, and it's 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 less hospital time and quick recovery than when we open. Because when we open, we have to go through the muscles, and muscles the long the the, the, the when you age, it takes longer to get healed. So that means longer recovery. So to open, we go through muscles, but when we do minimal invasive, it's small holes, and then we just operate through there. And success rate? Uh, success rate, it's all about making the correct operation and the correct diagnosis. So in most of the time, before we even operate, um, we have to look at a couple of things. We have to look at also when we repair the bladder, because the bladder in women it's, it's, it's very linked to the urethra. So we want to check whether when we lift it, will it make you leak urine later in life so that in the same time we fix the two. Through the vagina, we have to check if you're having what we call vaginal atrophy. So vaginal atrophy, if we're going to put in a mesh, 
uh, in your vagina it's atrophied that means now the lining of the vagina is very thin it's not that bulky the healing it won't be that nice and then you are more likely to get complications and then we have to make sure that you're not constipated and um, with all that and your general health as well if you're diabetic and things like that we won't operate you when your sugar is not controlled and things like that. so there are a couple of things which we look at no so easy that, answers <laughs> no easy answers but the success rate is good as long as the correct di diagnosis is made and the correct procedure is done okay let's go for another ad break we'll be back talking some more about urological problems dr mamitele is my guest and of course we're going to talk some more after the ad break. Craig Mamitele from the Urology Hospital in Pretoria is here talking about uh, pelvic floor prolapse and of course we're going to touch on one or two other issues around that area of the anatomy. Now Craig, um, I'm wondering, you know, as you've been outlining throughout the discussion, mm. you talk about older women, you talk about women in the menopausal years, yes. um, is that suggesting that uh, pelvic floor prolapse really does occur mainly in older women. What about younger women who may have had one or two pregnancies, still possibly in their late 20s or early 30s, want to still go on and have more babies, but they have this problem. If and when they undergo the procedure, what is the prognosis for future babies, future pregnancies in that young woman? All right, so in younger women, when we see them, usually their tissues are still, uh, they don't suffer from vaginal atrophy and things <laughs> like course. that. So um, we avoid using mesh. So in elderly patients, sometimes when, you, when the tissues are too lax and you think that it's gonna recur, we use a mesh so that it helps to hold the tissues together. So if someone is still planning to have more babies, you won't use that. Um, in some instances, we cover the whole uterus with a mesh to hold it up. So you can't cover the In older women? In, in younger patients. Okay. So it, it, remember when we operate, it's either we use the normal tissues and we just strengthen them by just reattaching them. Or we use a, a mesh so that will help the tissues to hold. But she's still able to have future pregnancies, babies? In, in, in younger patients, yes. we avoid using a mesh. Okay. We can use the, the tissue repairs. But that comes with the risk that when you are pregnant, you are more likely it, it, it may recur. Because when a child grows, you're increasing abdominal pressures. You're putting more strain to the pelvic organ, uh, pelvic floor. So it can recur in younger patients. So would that be the type of patient whom you would suggest to have a Caesar? It would suggest to have a Caesar, but the most of the time would tell them, depending on the grade. If it's a low grade, it would not do anything. You wait for them to finish their, to do their family planning. And then when they are done, then you advise them that from now on, um, you, need to con you need to avoid pregnancies because your condition is going to get worse and worse and worse. Even though she opts then to have a future pregnancy and the delivery through yeah. a cesarean section. Yes. Remember, it's still a risk. It's still a risk because that baby is heavy on the pelvic floor. Remember the pelvic floor holds everything up uh, which, which is supposed to go down with gravity. We've talked about certain risks throughout the show. What other risks have we not touched on as far as this procedure is concerned? Um, you mean in terms of complications? Yes, of, complications uh, and so risks. The, the, the complications that we normally see, it's, it's mesh erosion, the recurrence as well. So if you have someone who keeps on smoking, remember smoking does a lot of damage to the body. Um, it also damages your ligaments. It makes them lax. If you continue smoking, and then the weight as well. The more you gain weight, the more you're putting pressure on your pelvic floor, you're more likely to get that. Your constipation, if it gets worse as well, you're more likely. And if your chest issues, if you keep on coughing and things like that, it also puts pressure. Because every time you cough, you're increasing the intra-abdominal pressures. So things like that will make it to have recurrence or it increases the failure rate. 
And have you seen um, pelvic floor prolapse in men? I know you said it's very rare, mm. uh, but what does that success rate look like? Um, in, in, in males, it's not that common. Um, the ones that have been reported most is rectal prolapses. Usually it's handled by the surgeons. There's usually an underlying cause to that. It, it, it doesn't just happen. Um, it will be maybe with uh, some connective tissue diseases and then um, the surgeons will probably have ways and means of operating it. I don't have an experience in my short career with a male with a pelvic organ prolapse, but um, I've heard of rectal prolapses, but it's not in my specialty. We've talked very widely about pelvic floor damage or mm. prolapse as far as women are concerned, very especially older women. What else do we know or need to know about this problem? You also indicated that um, undergoing um, an exercise regime to strengthen your pelvic floor is also a very good idea, very mm -hmm. especially in your early years of life so that you're strong and healthy later on in life. Yes. Um, you also spoke about uh, hormone replacement therapy, mm -hmm. but that too comes with, it, uh, with its own side effects and yes, risks. Yes, yes. With, with hormone replacement, before we even start it, we have to look at your risk factors as well for, what we, uh, for things like clotting, uh, deep venous thrombosis before we give you, and the risk of breast cancer as well. So whoever, that, whoever starts you on that treatment, they will assess that. Another important thing is eating healthy and not avoiding to gaining excessive weight because that puts pressure on your pelvic Absolutely. floor. So weight and the diet is very important. We've talked largely about women and the urological issues, very especially mm. uh, pelvic floor damage. Mm. What are men presenting with as far as um, the um, discipline of urology is concerned? What's the most common uh, urological problems um, that men are presenting with? So men, um, <clears throat> I usually, when I do my teaching presentations, I say life begins at 40. Ah. <laughs> uh, from the age of 40, there are some men who start reporting erectile dysfunction and then um, prostate problems. Prostate starts growing around that age. And then even cancers of the prostate, they start increasing. And then bladder cancer as well. And then there are also other problems, kidney problems. Um, especially kidney, uh, recurrent kidney infection, kidney stones, and also kidney, kidney cancers as well. How dramatic or serious should one take the problem of kidney stones? Kidney stones usually, as, as in the past few days, we've been having a heat wave in, in, uh -huh. in Gauteng. So the more you dehydrate it, your urine gets concentrated. When things are concentrated, you're more likely to form stones. So keeping, making sure that you're well hydrated, drinking enough fluid, it helps to mitigate the, 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 the stone formation. So it is a problem in summer, especially white people, black people, everyone. It doesn't discriminate. It doesn't discriminate. When we talk rehydration, it's mm. not only, I mean, there's certain healthcare professionals who absolutely insist you need to drink eight glasses of water a day, but you could be having your liquids in any form, juices, teas, coffees, etc. or is that a no-no as far as you're concerned? Uh, so it depends as well. Some people like coffee. Personally, me, coffee makes my bladder to be irritated. It <laughs> makes me to go to the loo more often. So it depends from person to person. Some patients, they have what we call oxalate stones. Tea has oxalate, so you may form more stones if you drink more tea. But drinking water, it's usually the best thing. Another important thing about water in women, um, the more you drink water, you're helping, let's say you suffer from recurrent infection. If in fact you can flush out those in bacteria in your bladder by drinking more fluid and going to the loo more often before they settle and cause a serious bladder infection. So it has advantages to drink fluid. What I tell my patients is that when you go to the loo and your urine is very yellow or dark yellow, that means you're not drinking enough. So your urine should be light, slightly yellow to clear and then you know you're drinking enough. Okay, to wrap up then, what else do we need to ensure both as young males, females and also older people mm -hmm. in terms of a healthy uh, pelvic region 
um, so that we don't suffer discomfort, pain and inconvenience as we go through life. All right. So the first thing, as we talked about the, 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 the fluids, is very important. And then um, to go Should for we screening. Be, sorry for the interruption. Mm -hmm. Should we be, are there specific investigations or consults that older people, or perhaps even young people, should be undergoing maybe once a year, once in two years, just to check that everything is okay, apart from going for your pap smear and your mammo and your regular gynecological uh, checkup. Is there anything else you would suggest we do just to ensure general health and well-being? And most of the time when you go through a pap smear, they will examine you. And then that's an opportunity. If you have some kind of a symptom you're not sure about, don't keep quiet. Talk to every healthcare provider that is seeing you and helping you with a pap smear. And then they will quickly check. And then if they're not sure as well, they can send you to a specialist to go consult. And then men are the problems, they don't consult. The female part of it, it's much better. Females, they do consult, men True. don't consult. <laughs> I've had instances when, whenever they come in, um, there should be someone, maybe a celebrity who had the problem and then everyone just gets scared for that time and all of a sudden it dies down. When Polani Kuala had that rectal cancer, He's still having it. He's going He's in remission the, at the moment. Yeah. Thank God. So we had a lot of men consulting, wanted to know, am I fine? Am I fine? When Prahu Masikela had prostate cancer, died of prostate cancer, we had a couple of uh, guys coming in and coming to check. But what we advise patients is that from the age of 40, have your prostate get checked. That's for men, obviously. That's for me. During that consultation, it's always advisable to talk about your sexual functioning. The reason is, most of the men who get erectile dysfunction around the age of 40, it's usually an underlying symptoms for more bigger things. Ah. It's all about the, the blood supply to the pelvic organ. So if that blood supply is reduced, you're more likely to get uh, problems with erectile dysfunction. The same blood vessels are the same size blood vessels which are found in the heart in the brain and also in the eyes and in the kidneys. So they're also affected. So it's a sign which can um, expose other problems that you're more likely to find. So in some studies, they suggest that if the minute you start reporting erectile dysfunction, you're at risk of getting a heart attack or a stroke. So don't take it lightly. Don't put it to aging. It may be a symptom of an underlying problem. So serious indeed. Yes. And that is where we have to end the show. Thank you so much for being in. You certainly have educated us okay. as far as uh, urology is concerned. And hopefully we can get together again sometime soon. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity Mark once Lee more. Lee That was Dr. Craig Mamitele. He's from the Urology Hospital in Pretoria. He is a uro urologist himself, talking to us about uh, pelvic floor damage or prolapse and other issues related to that part of the body. Don't go away. We're going to be talking to some amazing ladies from a wellness centre, the Utpa Wellness Centre in Lanasia. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim welcome back. And it's the second part of the show this morning. And it's all about women and the difference they make in communities, in families, and of course, in the community at large. We have a group of ladies here, three of them. You'll meet the other one a little later on in the show. And they're here from the Utpa Wellness Clinic, which is based in Lanasia, Johannesburg. So let's meet and greet the dear sisters and unpack exactly what it is that they're doing to make a difference in the lives of families and the lives of the community as a whole. Assalamu alaikum, welcome to the program. Wa alaikum salam. All right, you are, uh, you are Safina Ghani and you are Rizan Largit. You are a counsellor and you are a counsellor and administrator at the Utba Wellness Clinic or Centre. But you both have been involved in this type of work for a long, long time. And the work we're talking about is obviously rehabilitation of 
those poor broken souls. And it absolutely breaks my heart to be sitting here and talking to you people about this, uh, very especially because it involves our daughters, our sisters and our mothers. And it shouldn't be happening, but sadly it is happening. So why would you say there's an upsurge of drug abuse amongst the women in our community? Okay, Julie, um, the Islamic Helpline has been in existence for 19 years. And for the, the case load has increased to such an extent that there was a need for this clinic to open up, right? And so we separated the other cases and all drug-related cases come to the Udpa Wellness Center. Male and female? No, just the female. The male, uh, the, the, the family cases come to the center and then we do a daily uh, um, a rehab, outpatient rehab program for girls. And then the males we refer to the other centers in the community. Um, the need for it is there's so much of pressure and social media and all the ills of society that we have to deal with in, uh, in today's times that uh, we see more and more uh, females being affected by it. And not just young people, or the older people as well. And I should imagine with older people, it's really over-the-counter yes, drug the addiction. Drugs. Your headaches mm. and cough mixtures, etc. Not that they want to go on a high, mm -mm. but it's their perceived or imagined um, ail ailments and illnesses mm -hmm. that they believe they are treating. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, what we have found with the prescription drugs and older people is, uh, remember, nobody sets out to be an addict. You, you play around with the drug because it does something for you, whether it's a prescription drug or the d other drugs, uh, the street drugs. The, the street drugs. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then when you're playing around with the drugs and you think it's safe, it's giving you the same high, or uh, the prescription drugs, people take it to maintain pain, manage their pain. And then after a while, they realize, you know, they don't even realize they've gone too far, they're too far gone. And uh, unless a family member realize, you know, picks it up, so, or observation. And with the older people who have very little um, supervision, we find that sometimes, you know, when it causes some organ damage, that's when the family is aware that something's wrong here. They take them to the doctor. When they look at the chronics and the, how much of the chronics they're taking, you realize that, hey, my mom's been taking three times the dosage. Oh, my mom's that, an addict. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, with you, I know that you live in Honeydew and you travel daily without fail all the way from Honeydew to Lanasia. You are a counsellor, you have been in the space for a long time. Why do you do it? It's a passion. It's also, it has affected someone in my family. Always. Always. Unfortunately. Yes. And um, yeah, you always want to try and make someone's life better. So it's a soul-filling, um, soul-filling job. <laughs> and I think that's what your drive is, is that it soul fills you and just to see somebody, you are helping somebody and making a difference in somebody's lives. But a heart-wrenching job anyway. Unfortunately, yes. How are you perturbed by the fact that more and more girls are becoming addicts and is it different treating girl addicts in our community especially as opposed to the boys boy addicts and also are the girls hooked onto the hardest substances or do you feel that they still even though they're addicted it's not the heroin and the cocaine etc they're still sticking with possibly dacha i don't know Unfortunately not. The girls are taking the hard drugs as well as alcohol and things like that. And, and the girls are getting hooked. Most of them take with their husbands. Oh, no. And that's the unfortunate um, part. Also girls are used in um, lolly lounges, you know, when and it's more accessible to them because they're not if they don't have money, they can always get a packet and be used by men that are buying for them and they're just sitting around and getting it. Unfortunately, um, uh, it is a... It's gone to that 
horrific degrading level where, where they, they are prostituting themselves correct. for drugs. That's correct. Mm. And uh, it's our sisters, it's, you know, it doesn't, it's not asking for colour, for rich, poor, it's everybody. And sadly, That's it's young people from perfectly normal, mm. good homes. And you kind of wonder, you know, where and how did it go wrong? But unfortunately, it has. Safina, you've also been in this type of work for a very, very long time. Are you surprised at what you're seeing? No, it's, it's almost as if you know what is expected. And do, doing the work we do, we can see or foresee what's next. But unfortunately, when we do, when in therapy, we try to get the families together. What we also find is um, when parents discover their the young people, uh, you know, are using drugs, then they're all hyped up and they want the help and they're looking in 10 different places, you know, to get the best help. But remember, if that is not sustained, you've lost the addict. Because an addict cannot do it on their own, they need that kind of support. Um, like Razan was saying, like, uh, you know, the different types of drugs that the uh, girls are using, how easy it is for them to get drugs. What we're finding in recent times, and like in the last five years, girls start off with alcohol. Muslim girls as well start off with alcohol, recreationally at campus, and then from there, you know, it just gets more elaborate. Um, and when, when, when kids do well at school and they go to university, parents, some parents, please, I'm not generalizing, um, think, you know what, my child's done well and they can take care of themselves, they know how to manage their time, they know how to make good choices. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen. What we don't zone into is at campus, the pressure is a lot. You get your focus a lot, but you also get people who, you know what, I owe it to myself. I owe a break to myself. I owe myself, you know, I, I wrote, uh, did well in my assignment and now we owe ourselves. And we're living in, in this community where we all owe ourselves, you know, we need the treat. We treat ourselves a lot more than the efforts we make. And if we can stay, you know, families can stay closer, keep in touch, you'll know it before it gets too far. And unfortunately, two people have to work. Parents are, you know, not, not monitoring um, their learners, the, sorry, the young people so closely. And on the other hand, you, you need to ask yourself, how closely can you monitor them? You cannot accompany them to, camp, uh, to the campuses, that kind of thing. But alcohol has become a, a serious problem with girls because in the past girls will start with weed. But now alcohol, and if you're over 18, you can get hold of it and that's what happens. I was talking recently to some young people and um, in fact, on this very show last year sometime, I had a Muslim sister from Lanasia who came in to talk about her sister's addiction. And what was very frightening she said her sister's addiction started out because the sister wanted to lose weight. And I think she started experimenting with something called Thai white mm -hmm. uh, or whatever it was. She lost weight rapidly. She was thrilled with the results, but in the interim got hooked to the substance that she was using. Are you finding that's happening with young women as well? Young women and young men for young that matter. Men. And unfortunately, Thai white is like heroin. And the withdrawals are terrible. It's a physical drug. Other drugs are more of a mind drug. But with Thai white, you get physical withdrawals. So as soon as you go to get a withdrawal, you need to use again. And that is also the cheapest form of drug. It's like 10 rand a packet. You can find it on any street corner. So yes, Thai white is a um, used for weight loss as well as crystal. And um, when you can't afford it, you go into the cheaper drug. Which is? Um, which is Thai white. Usually Thai white is heroin in its lowest form. Oh gosh, and mixed with a whole host of other rubbish. Yes, 
like detergents and retics and all Pool of those cleaners, things. Yes. Okay, we need to go for an ad break. We'll be back uh, in a minute or two talking some more about this terrible social scourge which hasn't left the Muslim community. We sit here thinking we're Muslim, this is not going to touch us, but it has proliferated into our homes, our communities and society at large. Don't go away, we'll be back in a minute or two to continue this very dark discussion on drug addiction and the wellness center and people like these beautiful sisters in the studio with me this morning doing their bit to try and clean up our families and our community. Sorry guys. I'm speaking to the sisters from the Utpa Wellness Center based in Linasia. Farzana Dabelia is waiting in the wings. She's going to join us in a short while to uh, talk about her role at the center. But right now we have Rizan and we have Safina talking about the wellness center and the scourge play, plaguing our community and very especially our girl children. Now I'm going to ask this question. I want to see how you're going to respond to this in terms of we know that Dacha has just been legalized a couple of days ago mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if that as far as you as counselors are concerned and a drug rehab center is that good news or bad news who, who would like to respond to that okay uh, okay <laughs> <laughs> you can go it's fine okay. you, you know yes it's been legalized in the home and for home use um, and a lot of guidelines there but the the substance hasn't changed in any way the substance itself it still has the same it's still effect. addictive it's still addictive uh, it still comes with uh, you know the associated behaviors and uh, it's still bad you know and i i understand uh, from what i understood the judge said that um, it's legalized and he has to come uh, you know arrive at this decision because the constitution there's a loophole in the constitution but then the constitution gives you freedom of religion, right? And uh, Satanism is a religion, defined as a religion. So it's about choice again. You need to decide, you know, make good decisions in your life. Um, what's scary with this decision is that we know people will go haywire now. You that know? it is a gateway yes. drug. All right, let's look at the issues around and I'm just wondering how you guys are going to deal with this when you know when you presented with it. Um, in your experience over years of counseling and nights counseling for women, what do you believe is the most deadliest of drugs? Is it easier to work with certain drug addicts because their drug of choice, according to them and you perhaps, is easier to overcome? Most definitely. Um we have crystal, we have the uh, benzos, and those are all drugs that, you, it's a mind drug. Highly addictive. It's highly addictive, and you don't need really meds to overcome it. But if you would go to the heroines and even crystal, you know, you have these um, mind mind playing things in your mind where you're hearing voices and that so you know you're not sure um, we have a lot of ladies coming in hearing voices and um, unfortunately the children are affected and uh, you know there's only like a three day period and then you have to refer them to the psychiatrist because it could be much more serious than you it's think really it damaging. is it's really damaging Safina, um, I'm thinking drug addiction um, and here's a, a, a point in question where what the young people don't realize is that it can push them over the edge, that it plays havoc with the circuitry in your brain, mm -hmm. that um, you could actually lose it, you could become an all-out mental case. How do you then, when you're trying to rehabilitate people, can you get that message across to them? Or are they so far gone that it just does not matter? Are they just fixated on their next fix? Julia, unfortunately, when they're already drugging, and you know, you can tell this a million times to them, that drugs are mind-altering. But do they fully understand that? Because uh, we've been seeing 
more and more cases of uh, addicts who in some form or another have a mental illness associated and it's long-term use that drives them to that point and you know you already see some of the signs when they're drugging you know the catatonic behavior where they speak very fast where they're not coherent and you can see you know what this person is not good not doing well and no matter how much you can uh, lecture or the parents when they're on that role it's very very difficult and and you know when you started the show you still spoke about how do you do this work we we do other we used to do other counseling before the uh, the center was separated but uh, working with addicts is very very difficult I because can you you know you have to pull them out emotionally draining yes and you know you can do a session uh, in another case uh, in um, another setting of counseling and different from when you're sitting with an a hardcore addict um and then everybody is the enemy where the family is not good enough society is not good enough and you have to you know sort and focus you have to bring the person back into focus because you can lose them in therapy in a short in a short space of time while you are really working with them and you think you've made headway they take you 10 steps back and it's because of the dr- the drug the effect of the drug that's uh, on them and long term use and and when you when the children are uh, discovered Generally, we find um, the parents who say oh, he's in grade eleven, and we found out we found him with the drug. The parents themselves, uh, you know, are shocked because the child is probably using from primary school. It's very long before they get put out. Um, so it's difficult work, but the mental illness setting in is a diff- is it's also a big challenge explaining. to them because you know it's too far fetched for them they can't fathom or grasp the stuff and they, as far as they're concerned it's not going to happen to them no, they're just on this no. constant high mm-hmm. and the mental illness is not going to impact on them at all mm-hmm. um you know i over the years have been looking at this issue and have been talking about it as well trying to create awareness in the community but in terms of let's assume you find a very young addict 12 years old 14 years old How easy is it to rehabilitate that person and clearly it seems that the methods that are being used currently ain't working so there has to be something there's a missing link what do you either one of you believe is that missing link because we're losing our youth yes. it's going to be a whole it's going to be a lost generation mm-hmm. unfortunately with um the younger people we don't have an after care facility we can put them into a facility which sanka is running um in north gate but when they come back they coming back to the same environment unfortunately and back to the same friends and emotionally they are not equipped as someone older than them to deal with the effects of drugs and normally these poor children are you know when people smoke um you always take the stompies and <laughs> <laughs> smoke the stompies mm-hmm. but Thinking and that's cool. cool yeah and that's what they think they you know they doing but when you test them they test for all the drugs um so you know they've they they may be thinking it's a weed but then this crystal or heroin or um naopia so it is very very sad are we seeing sad. more naopia in our community or is it still confined into the townships it's still confined in township and uh, you know what we don't see so much of that in indonesia um in lens we find there's a lot of crystal meth and weed mm-hmm. right and the alcohol Um just to add on to what uh, Razan is saying about um um sorry uh what Razan is saying about you know um it's we, we find it very challenging to work with the younger the, children the younger yes. children we find it difficult but we we see success when the person is committed because some children when they found out they they really driven and they you know they get up the fright and they work towards it and they come out of it while other children because they have associated uh challenges in their lives this is something they hold on to so as a coping mechanism so those are the ones that struggle it takes longer um and very important is the aftercare the support 
they get from their families and friends and the environment. That's very crucial, isn't it? Very especially with family and mm -hmm. friends. In our community, sadly, mm -hmm. it's something to be very shameful about. We're afraid we're going to be judged. We don't talk about it. Um, we whisper about these mm -hmm. issues um, purely out of shame. Mm -hmm. And we know we're going to be judged. And a lot of parents also in our community would suggest no my son or daughter is not doing drugs somebody did jadu on the child mm -hmm. how do you circumvent that issue and how do you make them realize this is real this is serious get help for your family and the addict otherwise it's going to be bad news look we do a lot of education around that and try to convince the parent you know then we separate the parent and the addict and we sit with the parent and explain to them that if, if that's the way you feel, if, because remember, we don't only work with uh, Muslim families, we work with other families as well. So what Muslim people would say, Jadu, and, and our black clients would say, you know what, we need girl, to go to yeah. a Sangoma. It's fine, do that. If you need to, you know what, uh, we need to uh, remove this uh, aspect of it so that we can focus, then you do that. You can pursue that avenue. Uh, you know, uh, reassure yourself and then let's focus on the drug. Because no matter how much I'm going to tell you, it's not Jadu. But if that's in your mind, you need to get it out of there. But, and that's what we'll do in the counselling. We give them the option because the moment you say people, no, it's not that or don't do this, people are obsessed with doing it and it will always be there. So we'll work through the whole thing with them to say, fine, if you feel it's Jadu, then you access that kind of help. Unfortunately, we can't do that. You go to the professional people, get the help, but come back because we need to work with the drug, the drug at hand. Okay, great stuff. We're going for another ad break when we get back. Uh, Rizana Debelia, pardon, not Rizana, Farzana <laughs> Debelia will be joining us. And welcome back. We're into the final segment of the show this morning. We're talking about the Utba Wellness Centre in Lanasia. It's a drug rehab centre and some amazing ladies in studio to talk about their time, their commitment and their dedication in trying to heal the broken people in our families and communities. And now to join us is the lovely Farzana Debelia. She's the programs manager at Utba. Salaam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Um, I see that you are the program manager, so what does your uh, job entail? Oh, okay, my job entails running the programs daily, which is the 12th step and whatever else we have to offer. So we offer a holistic approach. So we do the 12 steps, we do arts and crafts, we do some health and beauty, we do everything combined just, just to make a woman feel special or a girl feel special because they've lost all of that along the way. So we combine everything into one program, basically. And of course, they've lost their dignity as well. Yes. And you need to start building them up. Yes. Now, I think this is an amazing uh, initiative, the Utba Center, but it's targeted at girls only. I'm also aware that the, I'm not sure if it's still running, but a girls rehab center in Didier, would you know if it's still running? But it's in-house, yes. inpatient. Yes. Mm -hmm. It is, it's up and running. Okay, mm. and so now you've come with a different concept and that is outpatient. Why have you decided to go that route? Okay, we found a lot of uh, young mothers or even older mothers who are now addicted. Uh, like Razan said earlier, they start using with their husbands. So what happens is they have kids and they have responsibilities as well. So they can't commit to a full-time program. So this is nine to four where they can do their housework, come in and go back to their families. So it doesn't impact on their family time. So that is why we've decided to go with this option. So nine to four, five days a week or just certain days um, of the week? Nine to four, Monday to Thursday, Friday is half a day. Mm -hmm. uh, nine to 11.30. All right, and how many people, how many women or girls do you have at the center? Okay, currently we have a few. And then we do have those that come in and out for counselling as well. So you can choose basically what you'd like us, what, what you'd like from us basically. So if it's just counselling that you'd like or even parents, if the parents would like counselling on their own, we offer that as well. So it just depends on the person. I'm wondering, do you offer a service where perhaps you empower young parents and even young people how to say no? How to say no to drugs? 
Um, very difficult one, but um, I think we need to start thinking differently Definitely. to try and target this problem. Okay, uh, Julie, we, we do run a schools program where we do awareness from, uh, you know, uh, with the different campaigns. We run it in schools, uh, life skills program. And in the program, we talk about, you know, how to say no and how to uh, foolproof yourself from drugs. Um, but the program is not consistent because of the, you know, the present curriculum, when the school invites us and, and because of the, the, the shortage of time, it's, oh, we can only do it if the school gives us time. So it's how, not uh, so often. How much time do you need to get that type of a message out to the broader public? Okay. The first so let's assume go, you're going to a school. Yeah, how you, much you time would you go, need out of the school? Okay, you can go to a school and do a talk and expect uh, behavior change. Right? Behavior changes when you have consistent messages. So we try, we try to run a six-week program, but what we've been doing over time, uh, given there's uh, this uh, challenge with, uh, you know, accessing learners because of the curriculum is so, uh, com uh, so full that they need to complete the program, so now they brought it down to four weeks. But when we go over four weeks, uh, we, the, the facilitators who are trained go there, and they do uh, the, the program with them, the foolproofing or they want to become drug marshals and um, send, send these messages. So we leave them with the worksheet and then the next session we do a recap and then we go through the worksheet and the next lesson. In that way, this message, the consistent message over four weeks brings about behavior change. So we've seen some of that, but like I say, the challenge is huge. But with, uh, from the from the Udba Center, we also and the uh, Islamic Helpline, we are doing facilitation at schools. What is a drug marshal? The the drug marshal, where you 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 know what you get you identify when you're doing the the life skills program with the learners, they are ambassadors, children who are very passionate about it, and sometimes even children who are know a lot about drugs are probably already dragging but if you identify them and then you give them more skills how to help and support a peer so it's peer it's peer support uh, but at the school if there's a problem the like how you have prefects you have a drug marshal coming in and helping uh, helping the uh, educator and learners to support them through whatever it is or like in the second break, the drug marshal comes in and a few children have been identified using drugs. Then they spend time with them and, you know, motivate them. But using their language, you know, the younger, uh, it's a peer-run program. Prasanna, are you concerned that uh, the age of um, illicit drugging is dropping, meaning that uh, the, the children are younger and younger? Most definitely. We're seeing much more primary school kids now. The youngest boy at Mahali's rehab was seven years old. Oh. So uh, it can affect anybody, any age. And like Razan said, any school, any, uh, any gender, any nationality, whatever it is. So we are seeing a lot of boys between the ages of 14 and 16 coming in now. Uh, girls as well, but more boys at that age. Girls tend to start a bit later. So, uh, yeah, it, it is a very, very big concern. Do you believe that you have more success catching them at that age and start working with them? And unfortunately, we can't save every life that comes through. But do you believe that your success rates are greater in that age group or do you need to catch them younger? I think between the 14, 16 age group, yes, your success rate is quite high because you can show them where they're going wrong. You can help them before they get to matric and you, know, you can guide them now throughout. If they start at a later stage or they start at that age and they don't get help, then what happens is they go into matric, they don't go into university, so their whole life just becomes sort of a waste. Mm. You know, the next few years until they sort themselves out. If they do. If they do. So if you can get them to see the bigger picture at that age, then it's a very big advantage to them. How do you market? Now, Alhamdulillah, by way of this program, we're putting out a very strong message to our communities that there is a facility available for women and girls. But apart from that, um, how else are you attracting women to the facility to let them know that there is help and they can be healed and you will be holding their hands 
and they won't be judged. More importantly, you're not going to be judged for this. It's an illness or a disease like any other disease, and we are here to help you through it. Okay, what we've done is we've approached all the high schools in Lanasia. We've used the newspapers as well, uh, advertising basically on your radio stations and stuff. And also we do run a support group at night on a Tuesday night for it's open to anyone basically male and female predominantly it is male but also we use that as a platform you know to get more people in your thoughts on what you believe is the recipe for successful recovery for me it's a commitment from the addict itself if the addict needs to be committed to you know abide by the rules of the of the rehabilitation program um, the family need to be committed to support this person uh, through the addiction and um, is family therapy important very important because remember something the addict is is not a, a unit on its own we part of a family part of a community so when you do uh, when you counsel it's the environment it's a family everything that we need to factor in and a lot of the time it's the absence of family that cre uh, creates this hole in the soul because every addict has a hole in their soul you know this void that they need to fill and it's the absence of either family or fitting in or acceptance by the community some something to that nature would uh, you know cause a problem like this so the commitment from the family and uh, commitment from the uh, addict himself is very important because a lot of people when they get caught, uh, young people get caught and elderly people, you know, we're talking a lot about the young people, but we're talking about uh, partners, whether female or male, when they get caught and they're all very remorseful and sorry about it and they're going to work with the program. But addiction is very difficult to give up. A and we need to, as a community, we need to see that it's not it's past, you know, uh, just taking your dosages as the doctor has prescribed. It's long past that. Challenges that you've had, uh, I know you've been doing this work for a while, Farzana. What has been the most difficult for you? But I also know you had great success stories as well. Uh, the most difficult, like uh, Safina is just saying, it's very, very difficult to help an addict through what they are going through at that point. Uh, success rate is very low. Oh. So it's, it's absolutely demotivating, but like we always say, if there's a hundred people and we can help one, we'll be happy with that. How important is family support and acceptance and recognition of the problem? Oh no, that uh, family support is vital. If the family doesn't recognize a problem, the addict will never ever get help or come right. So even in our support group structure, we do have family. So like you asked the question earlier about Jadu. So a parent will come in, they'll say, no, no, my child's on Jadu. But they'll see there's 10 other parents there and they're relating their story and they'll think, okay, this is the same story. So then they forget the Jadu story sometimes and they re now they realize that the child is on drugs. So there's also rules that we put into place, which we call the three C's and the three P's. Which three is? C's being cash, car, cell phone. You cannot have any of those things once you leave a rehabilitation center or while you are in rehabilitation. And people, players and places. So it's the people used to hang around with, the places used to do things, and the group uh, setting sort of. So, so those are remove, the rules. Yeah, if you don't remove yourself from that, exactly. um, you, from those uh, triggers, mm, you're yes, going to yes, obviously trip up again. Yes. Final words from you, Safina. Julie, I don't know how to drive this message of mine across. It's a stigma related to, uh, you know, um, drugs. Because of the stigma, people do not accept, uh, access uh, uh, help, and there's so much help available. Um, what we find, even at our own outpatient, people we will come in, we, we, you know, because we are in a residential area, we find people stay away from the program because they're scared to park their cars. Remember, it's your life. You need to, to take responsibility for your life. You are accountable to the Almighty for your life and, you know, what you've done with it. So the stigma, we need to overcome that. And inshallah, we hope and pray that we can change minds through this program. Jazakallah mm -hmm. so much for being with me on the show this morning. And may Allah bless you to continue this amazing work that you guys are doing. Jazakallah for having us. And that's where we leave it. Um, a tough interview, tough questions. 
tough uh, responses to be dealing with but that is what we're being plagued with in our homes and in our community let's make dua inshallah that Allah gives us the courage to be able to take this head on and start healing our broken loved ones in our midst inshallah and on that note then we wrap up the show this morning jazakallah for being with us and as always um don't forget to take it easy on the roads and a big thank you to the production team till the next time as always it is assalamu alaikum and khudafiz from me julie ali <laughs> Jamrach al-Khair, Hala, Hanni Galbi, Hala, Jamrach al-Khair, Hala, Ya 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 Hala,